whether from America, from England, Europe, China, Japan, or Timbuktu, Suki Hotu. Right or wrong? Yes. You can't wish anybody Suki Hotu. But can you wish that everybody good morning? <laughs> what is so good about the morning? What's so fantastic about the morning when you say it's good morning? What do you read in the newspapers? All kinds of horrible things. Some rape, some murder, some people slaughtering each other, terrorists killing thousands and thousands of people, and yet wish each other good morning. Does it make any sense? It doesn't make any sense. We keep on doing it. Good morning, good afternoon, good night. The other point that I want to emphasize is that when you wish somebody good morning, you're not really wishing the person. Because if I meet the person in the afternoon, I will say, good afternoon. I meet the same person at night, I say, good night. So what am I wishing? I am wishing the time of the day. I am not even wishing the person. And I do it so mechanically. But I should be both to and confesses Venta, Karuna, Mudita and Veta. It is a rich greeting, it is referred to as a lotus greeting. You put your palms together and you wish that this person will blossom, will bloom like a beautiful lotus, the symbol of wisdom, the symbol of purity, the symbol of the Buddha. Now, this is such a rich greeting, but we never use it, and many of us even do not know that there is such a greeting. Now, I have deliberately chosen this particular tagline, so to speak, to try and make you think, to make you think, why, why, why do we keep on using a uh, meaningless greeting and throw away a wonderful greeting that we have, which belongs to our civilization, which belongs to our culture, which belongs to our spirituality. Why? Why do we go on doing such a thing? Why? Because of the culturalization. That is how we have to talk. Even I must make a conscious effort to re remind myself, hey, not good morning, but so keep on. So now we need, essentially, to be mindful of these kinds of influences that we have been brought up in the world today. And try and Decultualize, remove all of that, and end culturalize with something which is wholesome, positive, meaningful, enriching to us as well as to other beings around. So basically, basically we need to look at ourselves and whatever we do along this path. I have delivered, normally I spend one whole uh, presentation on this, but I don't have the luxury of time to put everything together. My talk this evening is on social ills and crimes. Social ills and crimes which is exacerbating all over the world. There are more social ills and crimes today than there was ever in the history of human time. It's exacerbating all the time. And we need to ask ourselves, why is it so? Every government, every, so many organizations, governmental, non-governmental organizations, looking at social ills and crimes. All these problems of uh, Islamic State, and, you know, all the terrorist bombings taking place, and the drug problem, and teenage pregnancies, delinquent behavior in schools. Not only are social ills and crimes more extensive in the world today than ever before, the kind of crimes that, that are committed are so shocking, unbelievable. The, the type of crimes. So that is another phenomenon. The third phenomenon is that the age level of those who commit these crimes has gone down to even 8-year-old and 10-year-old children. So something must be seriously wrong. So we need to look at this. 
we have not been able to solve these problems because normally we always look at the phenomenon, symptoms. We don't look at the root of the problem. We don't look at the root of the problem. We need to look at the root of the problem. And as I said, I'm going to telescope my presentation because as I, I normally take one whole day to discuss this serious, serious issue, which you are going to be involved, you are very, very involved. Because as youngsters, as I see, young, enthusiastic, very, very energetic youth in front of me, I am reminded that you are going to be involved in these issues, or rather you are already involved in these issues. And that is the issue of marriage and family. At some point in your life, you would be involved in relationships. And one of the relationships that we need to focus this evening is on marriage and family because these two institutions have eroded, have eroded so much so that they have become meaningless in many societies. And I thought we should focus on these two as one of the fundamental root causes for the social ills and crimes. Because in my own involvement with various charitable organizations and charitable activities and social engagement, I have recognized very clearly that many of these delinquent behavior of children, young as age and 10, and youth and adults, you can trace back to dysfunctional marriages, dysfunctional families. Most of them, most of them, Yet, we are not looking at this in a very uh, conscientious way. We just talk about it, but we don't look at it. Now, now the root, I recognize this at the root of the problem because we all come from a family. And the family is the unit of any of society. Regardless of whichever society you come from, the family is the unit of society. And when we talk about marriage, family, and society, what is beyond that unit? Who are we talking about? Who are we talking about when we talk about society, family, marriage? Who are we talking about? We are talking about ourselves. We are talking about ourselves. We are talking about human beings. We are talking about human beings. Now I ask you, have you given any thought, any serious thought about what you are as a human being? Do you understand what a human being is? Do you understand what a human being is? Have you reflected and contemplated on human being? What do you mean by a human being? Huh? Some say something. What do you mean by a human being? What or who is a human being? Huh? Yes, please. I want to make it as interactive as possible. Please, please, please. Who is a human being?
What is where? The term for human being is manusya. We need a being that has a mind, means mano or mana, that can be developed to its highest potential. A human being is a being that has a mind that can be developed to its highest potential. So there is a lot of potential in each and every one of you. And we are only looking usually at the physical side of the human being. We don't look at the mind part of the human being. You and me, from the days you are born, we look at the physical side. So now we need to look at the mind side. Why? Why do we have to look at the mind? First and foremost is the fundamental reality that all of your thoughts, all of your thoughts, all of your speech and all of your actions are determined by your mind. Nothing else. All of your thoughts, whatever you think, whatever you say and whatever you, have, you do is dictated by the mind. The mind is the forerunner of all of these things. Now, if the mind is the control mechanism, if the mind is the one that determines all of these, then surely we must look at the mind. Yes or no? Now, this is a fundamental law in all societies. In all education systems, I will talk about this in greater detail when I talk about holistic education. But, whilst this is the reality, we are not doing anything about it. Is there a period in schools anywhere in the world where they talk about the mind and teach about the mind? Whereas in the Buddha Dhamma, there is a whole body of very rich, detailed thinking and understanding of what the mind is all about. Instead, what we do is, we look at the physical human being from day one. From day one. We powder the baby, we bathe the baby, we clothe the baby, no? We do everything, we feed the baby all for the body. From day one. And we continue to powder ourselves, bathe ourselves, we wash ourselves, we feed ourselves, we develop muscles, all kinds of things we do for the physical body. But do we develop our mind? Do we cultivate the mind? Do we enrich the mind? In the school, in the house, nowhere. So is it surprising that this mind is now going all over the place in not so wholesome, holistic ways? Now, put it very quickly, I have studied this issue and I thought that we have to look at conception. And we need to develop this mind from the time that the mind is alive in the mother's womb. Education does not start in the college or in the school or in the garden. Education starts in the mother's womb. The mind is alive, the baby is alive. Whatever the mother feels, emotionally, spiritually, in all form, the umbilical form, automatically impacts on the baby that is born. In the teachings of the Buddha, this is referred to as Gautama, Parihara, the development, the protection and development of the mind. Not just the physical development of the mind, but the emotional, the spiritual, the moral, the ethical, the mental development of this mind. So what happens is that we ignore this. 
we ignore this. Now, if that is important, we need to look at it. Now, we were trying to do something with the computer just now. It refused to do anything because the program is corrupt. The program is corrupt. And the mind is a super duper computer. <laughs> if this mind is corrupt, then you get the social media practice. Very logical, very simple, but nobody is looking at it. Because it involves a lot. I have already gone to conception. Who is talking about conception? Today's mother is giving birth to a child just like that, like a routine. The father is not even around. The father has to go to hospital alone. Whereas in the Buddha's teaching, the father has to be conscientiously involved. Must massage the wife. Must feed the wife. You're all laughing. I see some of you laughing. This must be some fiction book. Huh? Or must be some other planet. Which husband is going to do that? Eat the wife, massage the wife, look after the wife. <laughs> but that is your job. This child is your child as well. Not just the mother's job. So we need to do all of these things. So that's why I have taken a lot of trouble to look at this subject. I am rushing through this subject. It's a very, very detailed subject. We need to spend hours and hours and hours. Normally I run one whole day's program or two whole two days program. It's all here, not to worry. Although I can't cover everything, I left this book here and we can get more books later on because of the page I could bring so many. It covers like a manual, the whole thing is covered here. So don't worry if I'm rushing too much. You can always refer the book and we can discuss this as we go along over a period of time. Now this is so vital that I have paid attention to before even the child is born. Now this child is going to be developed either in a positive way or a negative way if we train and guide the parents. Now before the parents are going to have a baby, they must be happily married. Yes sir. If they are not happily married, then can you expect them to have this kind of a program? You can't. So we have to go one more step backwards. Take you backwards to how to live a happy married life. Today, marriage has become like a fashion. Winter you wear some clothes, summer you wear different clothes or different season, and you just keep on marrying and unmarrying and remarrying. Just like you change clothes. <laughs> huh? And also in many, many societies, you can test drive before you marry somebody. Like you're going to buy a car, you can take a test drive with this girlfriend or whatever partner you have. Test first before you can get married. That's what it is coming to now. <laughs> like you buy a car. Uh, this is not know how to pick up some good uh, you know. This one talking too much or this one. All kinds of problems. Yeah. We have come to that stage. And marriage is not what it's supposed to be. Sacred institution. Commitment of two partners. And bringing up a wonderful family together is no more. In many societies. Now you are lucky because in your environment, and all the education that you are getting insulates you in some ways from those negative things. But even so, I feel, I strongly feel that you must be mindful and you must be thinking these things in a deliberate way. This is one of the most important decisions you are going to make in your life. Choosing a spouse a life partner is one of the most important decisions because you are going to spend the rest of your life with this spouse. So you must be prepared. And we as adults, we as leaders are duty bound, are duty bound.
to guide you, to tell you before you make the wrong moves or steps. So I am going around all over the world emphasizing the fact that this is not being done and that we have to do it if we want our societies to come up in the proper way. If we want to have no social needs and crimes or reduce social needs and crimes and bring in greater happiness, well-being and success. So, can you blame somebody if they do not have a happy married life because nobody has praised them, nobody has taught them. Today, I will just go through quickly some of the important aspects of marriage. First of all, we must understand that marriage is not something that you go into to take away. It is a partnership where you give. So if your mind is clear, I am entering into a marriage not to take but to give, then there is more than 50% chance that you will succeed. That mental orientation, that mindfulness is vital. If, for example, I enter into a business with you, I put in 100 rupees or 100,000 rupees, and if I take out 200,000 rupees, then there is nothing in the partnership. It will go bankrupt. Similarly, this partnership that you enter is working or going to work the same way. The more you give, the more you commit yourself to making this partnership blossom and flower and then bring out wonderful fruits of children, then it is going to be more successful than if you were to neglect, overlook or just see what you can get. So that is a very fundamental thing. Two, you must understand that you are marrying somebody who can be quite a different personality. You don't understand yourself. Normally, we don't understand ourselves. Sometimes we do things we don't even know why we did it. And we are emotional. I talk about the mind. We don't even understand the mind. The mind has got two, basically two facets. One is the rational mind and the other is the emotional mind. Even that we are not conscious of. The rational mind will tell you what is good, what is not good, what is what you should do, what you should not do. But the emotional mind always overtakes and we go and do the other. So all the more reason why we must develop mindfulness to tell us, look here, this is the emotional mind, I better keep it down and get the rational mind. So if we don't understand ourselves sometimes, it is going to be tough, more challenging to understand somebody and live with somebody under the same roof most of the day and most of the night. It's not easy. So we have to recognize that we are now becoming from two-legged animals to four-legged elephants. Can you imagine an elephant walking? If the two legs and the front legs and the hind legs do not coordinate, what will happen? <laughs> the elephant will fall. And once it falls, it is very difficult to get out. So remember this elephant you are going to become when you marry. When you marry, you are going to become a four-legged elephant. And you must always Make sure that the two front legs and the two hind legs are in harmony. They are synchronized, they are balanced, and they are helping each other. They are coordinating all the time. Okay? There are many gurus, you know, many uh, programs talking about how to live a happy, happy life. And of course, there are so many factors. But I thought I would take a few ingredients like you have for dinner and certain dishes that you cook, you know, for dinner. 
you put some ingredients. These ingredients make it whether it is spicy or whether it is salty or whether it is sweet and bring out a good dish. So in, in the happy married life, there are some ingredients that you can put in or you should put in. You must put in in fact. And the first I thought was unconditional love. Unconditional love. When you marry somebody, you marry the person for whatever she or he is. Don't try and make that person some other person because that's the person you marry. And most marriages go into problems, into turmoil and into all kinds of uh, painful experiences because you try and make the other person what you want the person to be. Two, we, could, we should even go even further. Make that person realize whatever potential or whatever she can be than what she is already. So not only she will honor you, but she will appreciate that you have helped her become what she is more than what she is at present. So look at it. Let's go to some of the ingredients. I'm going through very quickly, but these are all there but in the book. Trust and confidence. The minute you lose trust, if you don't have trust in your partner, all kinds of doubts, all kinds of suspicion will come into the mind. And the mind being such a, a, a what you call it, a, Problematic thing to control. He will start getting all kinds of monsters, and all kinds of disturbing thoughts, and this is going to affect the marriage or relationship. Have total trust and give your spouse that trust. Not only have, but give. If it's money, give the trust. I trust you with this money. If it is some chore or some work, give the trust that she or he should be able to do it. So the, that is very vital and this is lacking in many, many marriages. And there must be confidence in not only marriage and perhaps even more so in marriage than anything else. If you don't have confidence, the Buddha Dhamma is full of this reference or emphasis on confidence, sraddha, sraddha. You must have sraddha. Have total sraddha. The more sraddha you have, the more confident you are and definitely you will be able to achieve whatever you aspire. And if you aspire to achieve a happy married life, you will realize it in your sraddha. So these are other ingredients that we need to look into. It is good to know, but always remember you can't buy it from a shop. These things, these ingredients, unlike the ingredients you use to cook your dish, you can't buy it from a shop. It must come from within. It comes from understanding. It comes from right understanding. If you understand and if you contemplate, if you reflect, are mindful, if you are conscious of these things, it will grow in you and you will become these things. Don't expect to buy it from your neighbor or some expert uh, psychotherapist or you know, uh, psychiatrist or some other group. It is from your own thinking and your own habit. Now, here again, there's so much in the Buddha Dhamma about Shanti, Shanti. We talk about it, we read about it, we learn about it, but the test is in the marriage. The marriage is a wonderful test of your Shanti. Some of you even have names like Shanti. But are you Shanti? Are you patient? Are you able to accommodate? Are you forgiving? Or oh, are you all the time finding what is not there? Not able to see what is there always. Oh, this is not, 
not that. Oh, you didn't do that. Try and look at the positive, not at the negative. Appreciate whatever there is, rather than criticize what there is not. Human nature is like that. We are never satisfied. We always want to see what is not there. We fail to see what is there. And as uh, even in geography maybe, but normally in economics they say, if you give this half the class, most of them say it is half empty. But very few people will say it's half full. There's a lot of difference. If I have half of water in this glass, half full means I only need to fill the other half. If I say half empty, that means there's nothing right there, and therefore I have to suffer with the half empty. So this mindset, this thinking, this understanding, and this uh, consciousness is very vital. Not the honeymoon days, not in the first year, but throughout your life. Throughout your life. And you must give and take in all partnerships and also in marriage. You must give and take. Don't just take, take, take. <laughs> apologize. Apologize. Appreciate. I'm sure when you grow up, you will see this. You will find and you yourself might do this and most husbands do this. They go to the office, they will tell the secretary, thank you very much for this. Oh, how kind of you to do this. Can you please get me this? Can you please also and so? But when they come home, no appreciation for the wife. Darling, wonderful day. You know, I'm so glad. You will say, where is the food? Oh, bring the food, I'm so hungry. And not even a thank you. No, oh, please. This is the way we can to behave, but it has to change. We behave that way because no training. Nobody said these things. Nobody taught us these things. And it is the most important thing in our life. And the Buddha had talked about this. This is not my idea, please. This is from Sita the Sutra and many other sutras that the Buddha had talked about. Unfortunately, we tend to focus on the sutras to attain Nibbana. Huh? Become uh, very high, very high in the spiritual field. But down to earth, we forget. The Buddha said, no, this is important. How to live your life and how to make your life meaningful. As a father, as a mother, as a wife, as a husband, as a child, as a son, as a doctor. And he spoke and he talked about these things. So we need now to reorientate, and that's what I've been doing for the past several years, looking at the practice and practical application of the Buddha Dhamma in everyday life. Because most of us are going to live this life. Only very few of us are going to become Rinpoche or become Arahant or become some very spiritual being. All of us are going to go at birth, going to have, you know, a boss, or be a boss, going to have uh, co-workers, going to have children, going to have husbands, going to have wives. So we better look at these things and he emphasized these things. Sharing and caring. We talk about metta, we talk about karuna, but we are not karuna and metta to our wife or to our husband. Huh? We complain, we criticize, we scold, we shout. Where is the Vita? Huh? Where is the Karuna? But we, we teach, we learn, we recite. Karuna, Vita, all these things. Huh? Sometimes we are more kinder to the animals than to our own children or to our wife. We have to change. We have to change. We have to cultivate. We have to develop. That's why the Buddha always talks about cultivation. Cultivation of the mind. It is not going to happen just because you heard this talk. No, it has to be done every day, mindfully, consciously, cultivate these things. Then it will become second nature. 
that will become you. That is the only way. As you cultivate, you will become sharing, caring, compassionate, and friendly, grateful. Gratitude is very lacking in our societies. You have to be grateful. That is the first thing you have to develop. To be grateful that you are born a human being. To be grateful that you are born a human being. Because other beings are in much more woeful state. Despite all the troubles and tribulations you have gone through, and I know it, and I feel for it, don't feel that this is hopeless or useless life that you have. You can make a wonderful life, notwithstanding all the other handicaps, challenges that Take the challenge as an opportunity, as an opportunity to prove yourself, to accept yourself that despite all these things, despite being uprooted, despite not having a proper family, I, from the childhood, despite not being with your girl, kid and kid, that you have been able to come up in life, that you have succeeded, and you can walk tall, you can walk tall, that despite all of this, you have achieved. Take this as a challenge. Don't take it as a problem. Don't take it as a handicap, but as a challenge and live up to the challenge because then you excel. Then you are able to bring out the innate potential. Each of you have got innate potential. Every one of you, some potential. As I said, the mind can be developed to its highest potential. So develop it. You can sing, you can dance, you can write, you can read, you can say poetry. You can do science, you can do so many things. You can organize, you can be a leader, you can teach, so many things you can do. Be a wonderful mother, wonderful wife, wonderful husband, wonderful father. That's all you want. So remember this. This is especially important in the experiences you have gone from birth. Because you are at a point in life where these things are going to come into sharper focus. So the earlier and the sooner you are mindful and conscious of it, the better it is for you. So that you won't be in the wrong direction. You won't be misdirected. And you will make a better life. Can we go to the next point, please? That we have already covered. The reason why I'm focusing on this is that marriage family becomes the single unit of any society and if we don't look at that, we have all kinds of problems which is what is the scenario today. Now, family bonds again, unfortunately because of the uh, nature of society, the fast-paced society uh, and the consumerism and various other uh, what you call the distractions that make us delay, delay from our primary concerns and our primary commitments and responsibilities. We are going into problems of disintegration of family. In the old days, we had families which are what you call it extended families. We live close together. In the modern age now, you are going to be nuclear families. Many of us. And in your particular case, it is even more complex and complicated. So all the more reason why we need to invest more time and energy on the family. Very important. Because the challenges on the family are so strong that most families are disintegrated today. The pressures, the various pressures. Now, as a community, I want to share this very important teaching of the Buddha Dhamma. We talk about marriage, we talk about family, now we talk about the community. 
in the Buddha Dharma, the community is called the Sangha. And the Sangha is referred to as the fourfold Sangha. You have the monastic Sangha of Bhikkhus and Bhikkhunis, and then you have the lay Sangha that is supporting the monastic Sangha of Upasakas and Upasakas. We support the monastic Sangha. The monastic Sangha then helps us in terms of living a wholesome life and develop our spiritual being. So that is the relationship there. Basically. But Buddha went further, he went further. He said, within our lay Sangha, within our lay Sangha, we need to live as a Samadha. Samadha. That you and I are no different in terms of our association. I am a human being, you are a human being. I bleed red and so do you. All of us bleed red. Just try it out, take a pin and bring and see whether you bleed red. Do you bleed red? Yes. yes. We all bleed red. Regardless of, of where we come from, we all bleed red. And society must be cohesive and must regard each other as kin and kin. A fundamental failing of society is because we don't regard each other as kin. Suki Hotu itself is a greeting that regards you as a fellow human being. When I wish you Suki Hotu, I accept you as a fellow human being. I wish you that you will bloom to your highest potential and be a beautiful lotus. I accept you. And as I wish you Suki Hotu, I bring to mind Menta, Karuna, Udita and Vekar because I create a mind of Brahma a blissful state of mind of accepting you as a person who is And to get this message across, the Buddha had a very wonderful parable, the parable of the salutary, salutary. Once there was a gigantic salutary growing in the wilderness all by itself. It refused to live with or grow with other shrubs around the place. One day there was a tempest, a very strong storm wind, and blew all away this gigantic cell tree. It was uprooted and fell, but not the shrubs. The shrubs were able to remain rooted because they lived close to each other. They sheltered each other and they shielded each other from this storm. The gigantic tree that lived all alone was so conspicuous and so prone to the wind that it was up to. This parable went to China. From India, the Buddha's teaching, when he went to China, they didn't have cell tree. And what did they have in China? They understood this and they brought in the metaphor of the bamboo. That's why in Chinese culture, in Chinese civilization, art, song, dance, music, the bamboo is so prominent. It's, it's a prominent motive in Chinese culture. Bamboo, you know, brush paint and so on. Because the bamboo brought them to live together as a cluster and to help each other, protect each other, grow together and share together whatever difficulties and hardships they have. So they live in clusters and the bamboo, if the wind is blowing from that direction, will swirl this side together. And if it blows from that direction, without snapping. So that lesson is vital for you, very vital for you. As a community, 
be as close as possible to each other. Because that's where your strength is going to be. Your added strength. The closer you are with your community, with your own society, at least whatever hardship that you have will be lessened. And the future of your community is going to depend on how much closeness you can bring among yourself in this various diaspora that you have been forced to exist. So you have a mission inside. Apart from developing yourself as individuals, bringing out the highest potential that you have, bring back whatever you can to your community and bring about the cohesion of your community and how to build this community in such a fashion that come what may, come what difficulties, come what challenges that you will be able to withstand. Agree? This time not even a yes. Agree? Yes. Are you sure? Yes. Very sure? Yes. Now then? Yes. Now, how do you live a wholesome family? Let's go down to details. How do you live a wholesome family? Normally, they say parents on one side have a good relationship with the children on the other side, they will have a good family life. But that is a very superficial uh, explanation. We need to go beyond that. This is the conventional way of looking. Parents and one side, children, they interact no. We have to look at it holistically. And it has to be much more than just parents and children. First of all, the father and mother must have a good relationship. <laughs> Whatever the child experiences, negative or positive in the relationship between the father and mother, the child is going to live that. Whether you like it or not, the child is going to live that. So it is vital, it is essential that first and foremost, the father and mother must have a very wonderful life. Very good. Then from there, they would pass on that positive relationship to their son or daughter. Then the siblings will also develop a wonderful relationship. Brother and sister, or brother and brother, or sister and sister. That sibling relationship will blossom and flower. And together, they will make a wonderful, dynamic, wholesome, lovable, achievable, or rather achieving family. I'm sharing this. These are my two kids. Now they are all grown up and I'm a grandfather. My little daughter is already a mother. But this is how we need to bring kids up with love and passion and give them time to live together. Pick some of some them. So as they grow up, they must continue to have a sibling uh, affection for each other, sense of protection, sense of belonging. Okay, now this is a very difficult. How are we going to be time? I, 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 I stop here because this is another topic altogether, parenting, a very challenging topic, uh, but we must, we must know this and we must learn and we must be, be able to uh, cope with parenting challenges that you are going, you are bound to have when you have kids. We we'll stop here and I thought we would have some uh, question and answer and interactive session. Sorry to rush too because I have to do one hour. Normally next time we we'll have one day or two day and we can have a workshop discussion writing exercises, questions and answers, more dialogue.
Any questions, please? Uh, it, it encompasses thought, and thought is only one element of the mind. Thought moment, rather, is only one element of the mind. The mind has got the emotional mind, the, the, the subconscious mind, and all the various aspects of the mind. Uh, consciousness, uh, plus thoughts that have been accumulated from past life, karmic uh, factors that come in. Maybe in this particular context, what the author wanted to tell you is not to be tied down to a thought, not to be anchored to a thought. Think about the thought, address the thought, and then dismiss the thought. Maybe he's talking in terms of living the now, living the moment. Often what happens is our mind is running all over the place. The mind is never still. It is as the Buddha says, a fish that is taken from the water and wriggling. Or sometimes in the Chinese idiom they always say, the monkey mind. The monkey is never still, always visiting, moving. So the mind is like that. It's never calm, never one-pointed. So we need to be able to cultivate mindfulness so that we can focus. And normally, as I said, we can look at the past, which is useless. It's gone. We are thinking of something, we are following a thought that happened some time ago, and we are stuck with that thought. Let it go, finish. Now, here is so important. Or we think of tomorrow, tomorrow this, tomorrow that, or later, two hours later, or day after tomorrow, or next week, next year, when we have to live the present moment. So, possibly he was talking in terms of that context, but what you need to do is to try and get in what context he was talking about thought and mind.